Dr. Denoblin, thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, and I thank you all for being here. And I just want to, I go by Dr. Uma. Oh, and Dr. Uma, my apologies. No, under, no worries, and my last name is Donna Ballin. Um, it's truly an honor to come back here today to Massachusetts, I mean, from Massachusetts where I have been practicing. But my career started here in South Carolina. Mm. I did my medical school in New Jersey. And to back up a little bit, I'm originally from India. I came to this country with my parents in 1970 for one intention, and that was for education. And that word is what keeps me going today and learning about this beautiful plant medicine. Um, I finished my medical school in Jersey, came here to MUSC in Charleston, where I did my first life as a family physician. It was here where I saw primary care patients from all ages, helping them get pregnant to helping them die. And it was at that point that I decided that I really wanted to follow and pursue something more of a preventative nature. As a family doctor, the average patient I saw I called was on a party pack of five. Usually it involved a blood pressure medicine, a diabetes medicine, something for cholesterol, something for reflux, and something usually for anxiety or depression. And this was just five prescriptions that I filled, never mind the other medications. It was then that my journey brought me to the state of Massachusetts where I decided to pursue in preventative health and I did my master's in public health. And then I did my second career as a physician in occupational environmental medicine, where I protected workers and monitored them and did surveillance exams. My interest grew further, and I got involved in doing work with heavy metals, primarily lead, which also led me to the work in beryllium, which took me to the state of Washington, where I worked at the world's largest cleanup site for plutonium. That's how they treat cannabis today. It was there. I was working as a primary care physician, as an occupational environmental medicine physician, and also as a medical review officer. What my role involved there was doing drug testing and protecting the environment. So my whole life I had told people not to smoke, and then in my second half of my life I protected them, did surveillance exams, minimized their exposures, and monitored them. During this time, my mom had been diagnosed with an illness known as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a fancy term for, we don't know what caused your lung disease. My mom had never smoked. She had never worked in an occupation where she would have been exposed to this. It was about a year before she died in January of 2012 that I could still remember the day when she said, I can't believe they're using ganja. And that was my beeline into the bedroom. And it was there that she was watching a program about how cannabis was being used in Israel for lung cancer, COPD, and asthma did not compute to me. My whole life I told people not to smoke. And I, that was where my curiosity began. So it was about six years ago that I started to learn that I knew nothing, nothing about a system known as the endocannabinoid system. Today, I say that system is life, homeostasis, balance. Later I learned Dr. Damasio describes a system in five beautiful words. He says that the system is meant for us to relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. That has become my mantra about this system. When I look at these five beautiful words, an imbalance in these words could cause illnesses or diseases. If someone's muscle could not relax and they were in a constant spasticity, or their muscle hang and flaccid, imbalance. If they ate too much in obesity, or they couldn't eat enough as in anorexia, or if they slept too much as in depression, or they couldn't sleep as in insomnia, if they forgot too much as in Alzheimer's or in dementia, or they didn't forget enough as in patients with PTS. In protection, if your body overprotected, you had autoimmune illnesses like lupus, MS, cystic fibrosis, just to name a few, or if you couldn't fight off an infection like people that have diabetes or people that have been treated with cancer. So these five words mean a lot to me. Relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. And that's what I look at the endocannabinoid system. In all my years of education, I had never learned about it. And to this day, only 15% of the medical schools even teach it. It was after my mother died, 
and my contract ended that I became involved and started to pursue this as my career. Today I am proud to say I am a cannabis therapeutics specialist that's been certified with the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. I, Dr. Uma Dhanabalan, does not contribute to the opioid epidemic. I have not written an opioid prescription in over eight years. I have seen several thousands of patients and I make the statement, cannabis is not an entrance drug, it's an exit drug from pharmaceuticals and narcotics. What I've also learned is that in my population today, I see patients over the ages of 18 and above. My oldest patient has been about 94. What I am seeing in my practice is that the average age is over 60, and what I'm seeing is that patients that I see for the most common things is chronic pain, cancers, glaucoma, lupus, MS, fibromyalgia, PTS, anxiety, depression, HIV, and the list goes on and on and on. I'm proud to say that I don't use opioids in my practice, and I'm able to get my patients off of their medications, not just opioids, but also other pharmaceuticals. What I've seen in my population is that patients are improving their quality of life, and I can go to bed, and I know I'm giving them a safe medicine and an option. And I say cannabis is not for everybody, but I do believe it should be a first-line option, not the last resort. I also believe that this medicine can be an option for so many ailments because we do know the research. Three facts that I do want everybody to remember. Nobody has overdosed from cannabis. Number two, it was prescribed by doctors in the United States of America from 1850 to 1942. Today I do not get to do that. I can write a recommendation. Number three, the US government has a patent and has had this patent, patent number 663507, which was issued October 7, 2003. And this has been for all cannabinoids, not just one, but all cannabinoids as an antioxidant and neuroprotectant. And we've known about this. So today, cannabis is in schedule one along with heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. Unacceptable. So that is why I don't write a prescription for cannabis. Doctors can write up prescriptions for things in schedule two through five. And as other people have mentioned, schedule one is what allows them to write a prescription for cannabis. Today, I do not write a prescription. I write a recommendation because I do not have a schedule one license. Also, as a doctor that has chosen to be involved in this field, I do not get any payment from an insurance company. I do not work for a university. I do not get any Medicare dollars or Medicaid dollars. All my patients pay out of pocket to see me. So this means that there's vested in the patients that want to see me. What I want to also say is that what I'm seeing is pain scores are decreasing, decreasing their medications, their quality of life, not only for themselves, but with their families. Some of them have even been able to go back to work. And what I'm also noticing is that the things that I've seen, patients are losing weight, they're able to decrease their alcohol consumption and use this as an alternative. There was a recent study that summarized 10 things that they've noticed. Cannabis use does not adversely impact IQ that they noticed, that it is more of a social environmental factors. There's also lower BMI that we've seen, especially women approximately 3% and men 2.7% less. There's fewer fatalities in the states that have legalized cannabis, primarily between the ages of 25 and 49. We see also less prescription cost in the states. We see that there's $468 million decreased in Medicare D dollars in the states that have cannabis. 25% decrease in opioid consumption in two years, if not more, after that. And the list goes on. The three recommendations I always tell my patients is that start out by low or very low and slow with food. We tell them always to hydrate before they medicate and to journal because we don't know what they're getting. We don't know what the testing has been done, whether it's been even tested, and we do need to have testing done. We need to know what the cannabinoid profiles of these medications are, if they have been tested for contamination, and also shelf life. So further studies definitely need to be done but I do believe that it should be a first line option. And I use the three words in my practice, educate, embrace, and empower. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. Senator Johnson. Thank you, thank you, Dr. I, 
I, I agree with you, uh, and, and I think just about every every presenter has mentioned the fact that um, that education and research need to be done. The only thing I was wondering is why that's not done on the front end, but as Dr. Bay Bill, as the chairman said, I wanted to ask you, I, I think you said that um, that you don't prescribe opioids and those types of things. So so when, when patients come to you with these um, health issues, do you write a recommendation for cannabis or marijuana or whatever? Cannabis. Okay. Um, I don't need to write their prescriptions because they're coming to me to get off of their pills. Well, I don't think you can write a prescription for marijuana anyway. I think you have to write a recommendation. Recommendation. I, I, just, I just never heard anybody say that when people come to them, the first thing they want to offer them is cannabis as opposed to a prescription for some other type of FDA approved medication? Well, they're coming to me because I'm a specialist. So they're coming to me with hope. That's what they're coming to me at. Because they've had their doors shut. And I see three sets of patients. Patients that have never used cannabis ever. Patients that have been using it on a regular basis and return patients, as I say. People in their 50s that used it maybe when they were younger and now are looking at this as an option. And the other three things that I see is that patients are not able to talk to their doctors Doctors know little to no information, or they're being alienated by their doctors. So three groups of doctors are out there. Doctors that are being told that they can't even talk about this because they work for a federal entity. So there's no incentive for doctors that work at the universities to even discuss this with their patients. And a lot of the patients are being thrown out of their practices when they talk to their doctors about this. I, I guess what I'm wondering, doctor, is, I mean, until or unless this law passes, uh, marijuana is basically illegal. Um, on a federal right. level. Right, in the state level. I mean, Not even federal. Huh? On a federal level, it's still illegal. So even if it's on a state level, the problems I'm facing is I'm in Massachusetts, so we have a legal and so-called recreational, but when my patient gets admitted to a hospital, they can't use their medicine in the hospital because it's a federal site, right. well, and federal sites get federal money. Let me clarify. What, I guess what I was trying to say is that um, a lot of people get in trouble with the criminal justice system for buying, selling, using marijuana. And I just, I'm still kind of puzzled that when, when people come to you, that's your first offer is to, to recommend cannabis. But I understand that. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, I just want to make sure I understood because I'm trying to keep all this stuff in my mind. I'm writing some notes. But I think you said that you don't accept any type of insurance. Is that what you said? Because this is not covered by insurance. Okay, so, so when, when I come to you, um, I'm gonna pay you cash. We take insurance money is nothing that's commanded by insurance. We give them a bill. Patients can then submit that to their insurance companies or to their health plans. Some patients have a flex plan where they put money away and they can use those dollars to come see me as well. Okay, so so people who um, I guess are low income or or, or, or have nots, they 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 can't afford to come to you and pay you out of their pocket. For, for your services. And that's exactly what's the problem here. What's happening is that patients that can afford it get a medical card. Patients that can't afford it don't get a medical card. So what it's really doing is what I look at cannabis is two things. It's either medical or it's industrial. Mm -hmm. So this concept of recreational, to me, it does not fall in my eyes because people are self-medicating. Mental health is affecting at least one in four people, if not more. And alcohol is acceptable and legal, and that's what people go to, or they can legally get these prescriptions from their doctors and pay $3, or they have to save their money to come up and see me. And this is where I really feel that it's being limited to patients that can afford it, not the patients, it's not being available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Only the people that can afford to come and see me can come and see and become legal. If you can't afford the money, then you can't become legal. That's what it really comes down to. Yeah, okay. I, I, and I appreciate the fact that all of the physicians or the medical professionals that are here are, are, are want to uh, provide services to help their patients and save lives, and, and, and I really commend that. But I, I just have to say on the flip side of that, um, I was just reading that uh, in 2010, uh, nationally, marijuana contributed to nearly 3,000 traffic fat fatalities. 12% of all traffic deaths, and more alarming is that um, uh, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, nearly half of the f fatally injured drivers who tested positive for marijuana 
were younger than 25. And I only say that to say again that I don't want to be in a position of trying to resolve one issue and create others. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I've been in the MRO as a medical review officer. We do drug testing. And if somebody uses marijuana and they've been using it for a while, they, they could still test positive, but they're not impaired. And people that test negative for other drugs are impaired. So that's another clear point that you bring up. Because people are facing jail sentences for testing positive for a drug, and they're not impaired. Okay. So cannabis can stay in your system longer. Mm -hmm. And so drug testing is not the way that we should be looking at this. I think we really ne need to be looking at impairment testing, not drug testing. Okay. But, but you bring another point because also the concern I have is as I travel throughout my district and talk to the major industries, um, Continental, Caterpillar, places like that, and, uh, uh, and as I go talk to young people, I try to convince them how marijuana can really mess their lives up because these, these industries um, have good jobs available, um, high-paying jobs, good benefits, and it's amazing the number of people that these companies make a job offer to, and then at that point, when they're ready to make that offer, they can do drug tests. And you're right, uh, marijuana stays in your system longer, from what I understand, and they do that hair follicle test, and then these folks with college degrees and with, with potentially bright futures, the offer for the job is, is rescinded because of marijuana. And so, again, I don't want to solve one issue and create other issues. into a pharmacy job, okay? And he goes to a laboratory and gives a urine sample, and he tests positive. I, as the medical review officer, would be calling Joe. And if, let's say Joe says to me, Dr. Uma, I have ADD, I have anxiety and insomnia, and I take opioids, okay, for my chronic pain, my back pain, and I take Adderall, let's say, for my ADD, and I have insomnia and I have Xanax, and if he proves me those prescriptions, I don't report that as a positive test to the employer. I report that as a negative test. But if Joe had smoked a marijuana cigarette and he tests positive, he's just lost his job because I have to report that as a positive. So there's inequalities and things people have to understand what is happening in our system. And so what I'm trying to explain to you is that nothing is perfect, but I can go to sleep knowing I'm not letting somebody die because my medicine may make somebody happy, but it's not going to kill them. I can't say that about a prescription that's out there because it is synthetic. And the more and more I learn about this endocannabinoid system that I did not learn, and that's what I'm saying, if we can concentrate more on one learning about the system, we would find out how this works, how the imbalances affect illnesses, and how we can appropriately use this plant, maybe to even cure illnesses and prevent illnesses. And I just want to read some experts out from the um, patent, and I'm going to leave you guys a copy of this. And if you guys don't know about this, the patent came out in 2003, but it's based on research, like they say, from MUC, MUC and years before. So um, I'm just going to read. Dr. Uma, if it's anything we can read, it's already there. Okay. Have you sent um, it to us? Uh, Sarah Davis also wants to engage with questions. Oh, why don't you ask the questions? Because I feel like what I want to see is that this is going to be a part of a first aid kit, is what I eventually see cannabis as. Okay, it'll be red, white, and blue in my imagination. Red will be a um, EpiPen for respiration intoxic, and white will be a Narcon pen for um, intoxications, opioid or otherwise, and a blue will represent any kind of a traumatic brain or cardiac event where a patient will receive uh, a dose of a vaporization or a nebulizer treatment. That's what I see happening with this plant, where it will be preventative for our people that have traumatic brain injuries that this could be used as a prevention for other complications that could be avoided. Doc, Dr. Uma, um, I'm already anticipating when we get to debating mm -hmm. this bill what the opposition is going to center around. I mean, I've been picking up a theme, um, and the theme is this. Uh, even if it takes 10 years, 20 years, we need to wait till the FDA approves this drug in order to make it safe for patients. Um, nothing short of FDA approval will do. Um, in your opinion, do you think that cannabis needs to be approved by the FDA before patients should be able to access it? And if you don't think that's the case, why? Um, I'm, I'm glad you said that. You know, Noam Chomsky said that medications have been FDA approved, but cannabis was people approved. So 
along those lines, what I see is that when we look at risks and benefits, that's what we look at for most things, an 80-20 rule. And with this medicine, we can give options to people. That's what I'm saying. And it doesn't need to be FDA approved. We have zero deaths. This plant has been around for 10,000 plus years. I don't know what part of zero we don't understand. All I ask is for people to open their hearts and open their minds. You don't have to use this plant, but you know somebody can benefit from this. And there's science to this. That's what I'm saying. This is not snake oil. There's a system known as an endocannabinoid system. People are deficient in cannabinoids. There's no Xanax deficiency. There's no oxycodone deficiency. But there is a cannabinoid deficiency. That's what I'm understanding and why I want people to understand this. And that's, and that's one of the most compelling things that I think has come out of the testimony today is that the 2017 National Academy of Sciences report found substantial and conclusive evidence that cannabis is medicine in regard to these conditions. So, I mean, we keep hearing from the opponents that all you have are anecdotal stories, all you have are, you know, you know emotional, you know, tear-jerker stories, but there's no peer-reviewed evidence, there's no empirical evidence, there's no scientific evidence, no scientific groups out there endorsing that. And one of the most valuable things that we've learned today is, is that in 2017, just a month and a half ago, the preeminent Science, federal science group, the National Academy of Sciences, said there was substantial and conclusive evidence this is medicine. So I'm not really sure how we how you get beyond that. And I, and I think that's why you see so many people who historically have opposed this are changing their minds now. Is that not right? And, you know, I want to tell you a story. You know, I started this with my mother that I told you that I could never give this medicine. About two years ago, a man, a man by the name of Bill Davis that's here in Anderson, South Carolina, Bill contacted Davis. me. And I know him because he died, uh, almost died of pulmonary fibrosis, which my mother died of three months ago. Uh -huh. And if she had had access to that, and if your mother had had access yes. to that, she and your mother would be benefiting the way Bill Davis is right now. So yes. I don't need to be told by anybody that this isn't medicine and that this doesn't alleviate suffering. I know firsthand that it does alleviate it. I, that's why I can breathe, and I'm here traveling today, and I'm going to go back to Chicago to a meeting that's going to talk about laboratory testing. I'm proud to say that, yes, I didn't get to use this for my mother, but there is a man alive today. When he called me, he said he had 90 days to live. He was on oxygen. He could not walk from his front door to his mailbox. He's walking three miles a day today. He is inhaling cannabis every day. He's alive, and I am proud he's out there preaching. And he's having to break the law to do that, isn't yes, he? And I, when he first called me, you know, he said to me, he said, Dr. Uma, I have the illness your mother died from. And when I asked him, are you using cannabis, he said no to me. I said, well, you better be. And halfway through the conversation, he said to me, Dr. Uma, I have to tell you the truth. I'm a preacher. I can't lie to you. I am using it. I said, please keep using it. Please start journaling. Please start taking a peak flow meter before and after you use it. And we're going to talk to his doctors at Emory, and we're going to pursue this because this is medicine. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.